Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're uh, back in session with the Washington State Bar Association Board of Governors meeting. Uh, we have with us today guests from the Idaho Board of Commissioners. Uh, and welcome to all of you. We're excited about the opportunity to meet with you and, and talk with you. Um, this has been in the works for some time uh, in, in the Washington State Bar Association. You spend uh, 14 months almost as president-elect and then a year as president. And I started th thinking about how to coordinate with our sister states, surrounding states, um, almost two years ago. And I'm glad that uh, we finally have an opportunity to meet with you and uh, we're excited to come to Boise to do it. Um, I thought the best way to start off would be probably to go around the room, introduce ourselves, <clears throat> maybe say a little bit about what your uh, legal job is, your day job, and then um, perhaps as a conversation starter, uh, what do you think the biggest issue confronting the Idaho State Bar or the Washington, Idaho State Bar or the Washington State Bar Association, as the case may be, um, and so that we can generate some kind of a discussion about those issues. I imagine that uh, there's a lot of things that we can uh, learn from each other and, and a lot of similar issues that are confronting both states. And like I said, I'm excited about the conversation. I'll start off and then we'll go around the room to my left. Um, as I said before, I'm Kyle Schichetti. I'm the president of the Washington State Bar Association. I'm in my 10 months. I'm about to hand it off to Judge Tollison down here uh, and he'll, he'll begin his uh, term uh, in September. I'm a member of the Washington State Bar Association, but I'm also a member of the Oregon um, State Bar and the Idaho State Bar. Um, I grew up in Spokane. We have a family that came from Kellogg. Uh, we have a cabin in Coeur d'Alene. So I spent a lot of time in Northern Idaho. Then I moved uh, 20 years ago to Vancouver, Washington, and I'm with the law firm of Miller and Nash. Uh, with offices in Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, and uh, Long Beach. Uh, my practice is um, a mix of representing businesses and as outside general counsel. I have a lot of uh, construction clients. So I have a niche in that area. And I also do litigation and uh, uh, kind of the general practitioner, um, which I enjoy because I get to learn a lot of different things, different people and uh, uh, get to know my clients' businesses, which I, I like very much. Uh, I'll turn it over to past president uh, Rajiv Majumdar. And then, like I said, let's go around to the left, around the room, and then we'll end up back here. Good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm uh, probably happiest to be here because I am an Idahoan. I was raised in Idaho Falls. Idaho, and I went to college here down at the uh, Albertson College of Idaho, though I understand they're back to calling it something else, you know, against my wishes. They don't listen to me. Um, I am also, I'm a small town general practitioner. I work in a town of about 5,000, serving all kinds of people. I'm a town prosecutor and business and transactional guy and do defense a little bit in other jurisdictions and serve as a pro tem uh, hearing examiner there and there for land use. Um, I'm just feels so good to be home, and I'm so glad to see all of you here. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Brian Tollefson, and uh, I'm the incoming president of the Washington State Bar Association. I have a dispute resolution business along with a couple of my former judicial colleagues that we've been running now for about almost five years. Um, prior to that, I was a Superior Court judge Pierce County, which is Tacoma, is the county seat, just south of Seattle for uh, a little over 27 years. Prior to that, I was uh, in a law firm with about 16 other lawyers, started out as an associate, and then became a partner. I did that for about 10 years. And prior to that, I, was, uh, I, I worked for the state Supreme Court as a law clerk to, to who was then the chief justice of the state Supreme Court. So had a variety of different hats and uh, really uh, find, uh, I'm really excited to talk to all of you this afternoon. And let me interrupt because I broke my own rule. The uh, third part of our discussion was what was the biggest issue confronting our bar association? I'll start and then you guys can go and then we'll pick up where we left off. I, in my opinion, I think the biggest thing that we're confronting right now is the 
litigation over integrated bars and what that might uh, mean for the future of bar associations, Washington Bar Association for the state bar uh, of those states that enjoy uh, an integrated bar. It, it uh, you know, a little research that past President Majumdar and I did uh, when the uh, we, follow, we actually followed California way back in the 30s to become an integrated bar as more of a uh, access to justice issue and being able to provide those services. And now uh, California has gone uh, separated into a voluntary and, and uh, regulatory. And I fear that that could be the case for many of our bars if some of these rulings are continued on up to the Supreme Court. So I would say that that's one of the biggest issues facing our bar association. Yeah, and, and I'd say one of the major issues facing our, our bar association is the trend in law to be increasingly urbanized and increasingly specialized. And uh, our, we've just formed in our state bar a, uh, uh, it's called the STAR Committee, it stands for something. But, but, um, small town and rural something, rural practitioners committee. Because we're having a hard time getting lawyers to our vast uh, rural hinterlands. Um, I have a heck of a hard time trying to get people to come uh, join my practice, and it's a good practice, and, um, you know, uh, I suspect we have, may have a lot in common in that respect. Okay, well, in addition to those uh, issues facing uh, our Bar Association, I would say, in addition to those issues, um, from my perspective, one of the big issues is going to be how to get the wheels of justice moving again. Um, COVID has um, just wreaked havoc on um, getting to court, getting juries, uh, getting <clears throat> resolution of cases in a timely manner. And I don't see that um, going away anytime soon. And even when it starts to move again, I can just see the, the snowball problems that are down the road. So I think that's one of the things that needs to be addressed. There's going to be no fun problems left by the time we get over to you. So I'm Sarah Nagalski. I'm the chief communications and outreach officer for the bar. Um, I would probably have picked some of these as well, but I think from one of my perspectives, at least as, you know, doing public outreach, um, just really looking at access to justice issues. And it's been such a big year for the public's perception of how, lawyers and the law serves them or doesn't serve them and what that really looks like to help people learn how to connect and similar to what brian said you know i think some of what's come out of the pandemic um, has just really been astounding uh, about how different courts at different levels and jurisdictions just operate so completely different and your experience of justice from one area to the next can be so different in the same state, you know, even lawyers can't figure out um, sometimes how to navigate those things. So how would a regular person be able to do it? So I think they all kind of snowball together. Are we going to the screen? Are we going around? All right. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Brent Williams Ruth. I am the governor from the eighth congressional district. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of bordering five other districts in the state and that I start on the west side. Uh, not touching the Salish Sea, but going over the mountains and ending in the Lake Chelan, uh, Wenatchee, Leavenworth area. So I have a very diverse territory um, that I'm proud to represent. And again, I would say that, oh, and I am a, in my daytime practice is that as an estate planning, elder law and uh, estate administration attorney, as a solo practitioner, I went, I had a career as an insurance coverage attorney that uh, left me successful, but yet unfulfilled. And so I switched to death and dying because that's a lot more fun. And um, what I believe is, is one of our biggest issue, it really relates to what uh, Director Nagowski's area is, and that's the connection with our members and having them uh, know what we do and not just be a mystical organization and board and really getting out there. So. Um, that's something that, that I've been working on during my term, and I'm in my first of three years, finishing my first year in September. I'm uh, PJ Grabicki. I'm the uh, 
fifth district governor uh, representing Eastern Washington. I practice in Spokane with the Randall Danskin Law Firm. I'm also a member of the Idaho and Texas bars. Um, and my uh, practice um, centers on transactional tax, uh, state planning and the like. Um, the most important issue I think facing us as an organization is the uh, threat to our existence um, posed by um, the um, set of cases that have been coming down regarding um, integrated bars. Um, when you read the um, Fifth Circuit case in Longley, which just came out a couple of months ago, I think in July, um, that seems to be the most um, articulate, well-reasoned and specific case on the issue and seems to provide um, possible guidelines to how we can survive as a mandatory integrated bar. But um, that's gonna require a lot of work on our part. And um, I think that uh, time is not on our side. And I think the same issues uh, apply to um, the Idaho bar. Longley was a Texas case, so I'm affected by that as well. Um, but the, que the question we all have to grapple with is what are, the term is germane. What are germane issues um, that we can deal with as the bar and what are non-germane um, that uh, create a First Amendment issue that may uh, do us in? Good afternoon. My name is Russell Knight. I'm an at-large governor on the Board of Governors. I have a practice in Tacoma, Washington, uh, business litigation, construction disputes, investment disputes, and other related um, civil litigation. Uh, my colleagues have all touched on very important issues facing the, the bars coming up in the future. So I'll, I'll mention one that I believe we've just concluded, although, you know, when is anything ever done? And that is um, the issue of attorney malpractice. Um, the great state of Idaho was an example repeated over and over again of uh, why we should mandate malpractice insurance. And this is a sort of shining example of how it can work. We didn't go with that model. We went with a different model, but um, uh, the, the, the discussion, I think, I think it highlights the importance of our neighboring bars getting together and discussing those issues, because I don't think they're really fundamentally different from state to state. And uh, there's no point in trying to reinvent the wheel when uh, we can have a little bit of collaboration on some of those issues. Yeah, my name is Brian Peterson, and I represent the 9th District, which is a perfect gerrymandered district, as all the Washington State districts are. Um, I have Mercer Island. I think I have all of Mercer Island. And I think I have all of Bellevue. And then I have about nine other cities, partial, partial, right? So kind of fun. In any event, I, um, I, I do corporate law. That's all I do. My office is on Mercer Island. And um, I'm really happy to be here with um, all of you. And I'm, I guess my hope is that we, you guys can give us a good idea or two. So maybe we can improve our bar a little bit. So looking forward to it. Hi, Brad Andrews, Bar Counsel for the Idaho State Bar. I've uh, served as uh, Bar Counsel for 18 years. Uh, prior to that, I had a short period of, I started at the uh, Attorney General's office in the Natural Resources Division, clerk for a federal judge, and I was in private practice for 20 years. Private practice was, uh, I started in uh, primarily in litigation. Uh, the middle part of my practice was uh, transactional work. I worked with a lot of sports related companies, and then I kind of finished up um, as 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 they sold their businesses, I uh, went back to a little bit of litigation. Uh, from my standpoint, I talked to probably more lawyers than anybody does in the state as part of my uh, job of answering the phone for ethics questions. I'm, 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 my concern right now is where are we going with the future of the practice as it relates to Zoom and pandemic technology. I'm also concerned about this recent, the recent surge and talking to a lot of lawyers in our, in small practices and feeling isolated. And I, uh, we have an, a, 
uh, we have a wellness committee of the, the bar that's working on that. I'm not overly concerned about it, but I, I'm keeping an eye on wh where, where are we? I think people were feeling good about coming out. And now that we're maybe moving back in, um, there's a little bit of isolation in um, your, our, our, our state is small and it's spread out. You don't feel much of the isolation in the urban areas, but you do feel it in, in the uh, other areas. Hi, I'm Maureen Braley. I'm the associate um, director of the VAR. So I handle bar admissions, MCLE, and then help Diane out with the general operations and administration of the bar. And I'm really excited to meet with you because I lived in Spokane for seven years, Gonzaga undergrad in law. And one of your board members, I think I went to law school with Hunter. I don't know if he's on Zoom, but I think he was a year behind me. But um, anyway, so it, it's fun to see you. And I, I think everyone's saying ideas that we definitely talk about on a daily basis in Idaho is what's facing our bars. Hi, I'm Diane Minnick. I'm the executive director of the State Bar and our Law Foundation. I have been at the bar since 1985, um, like pretty much my whole life. Yes, I, I was like in my 20s when I started. Um, I've had this job since 1991, so 30 years. So I've seen a lot. Um, I was on a call with bar execs the other day, and I, I always think that we can learn from each other. And there's always something new. And somebody else, if you try something new, someone else did it. And generally, it's going to go wrong in Washington or California or, or Texas or California first. So you watch them and see how it goes. Um, the pandemic is the one thing in all these years that none of us have dealt with. And so I think that has been a challenge just in terms of from a staffing, from a bar, from a services, as Brad says, from you know the membership. Um, it's been an interesting um, year and a half uh, and, a, and a struggle in a lot of ways. And one of the things that come out of it on the other side of the bar members is just the public. And they're struggling a lot more too. They're struggling with whether they understand the law, what their expectations are. They're angrier about things. You know, the people that call and need help. Um, it, it's a tough one for our staff. Um, and I think for all of you as lawyers to deal with the people that are just so, they're pent up um, fears and angers and, and lack of understanding about how the system works. So if we can work um, on some of that, I think is important to all of us. Um, and I'll let the rest of them that actually are the governance people tell them what they think it is and see if I can know if I agree or not. <laughs> or know about it. Thank you. I'm Anne Marie Fulfer. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Anne Marie Fulfer. I'm currently the president of the Idaho State Bar. I represent the first and second districts, which are the two northernmost districts in Idaho. Uh, so I border up and I'm, I live in Moscow, which is eight miles from Pullman. I'm 90 miles from Spokane. Um, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who practice in Washington. And as the assistant dean for career development at the University of Idaho College of Law, which is my day job, I send a lot of students back to Washington to work. Um, so I, I come from a different place than a lot of people who are practicing attorneys. I see some of the problems as the cost of law school and helping students get through law school without having a lot of debt. Because we wanna get students working in rural areas. We have a lot of rural areas in Idaho, but how do they do that if they have a lot of debt to, to go in and work in these uh, small towns? Um, and, and there are attorneys who want to hire students, but maybe they don't have uh, the salary base to do that. So then we've got complicated contracts that young lawyers are starting out with where maybe they'll get an advance for six months. And then after that, they'll get paid 50% of what they bring in. And it, it's, um, so I guess I see money as the big issue. Um, going going forward with from law student to young attorney and on. 
I'm a Kurt Holzer. I'm a plaintiff's personal injury trial lawyer. I'm a past president of the Idaho Trial Lawyers Association and the president-elect of the state bar. That gives you, give you an idea of, of who I am and where I come from, from the perspective of law. But Anne-Marie and I um, uh, both have this focus, I think, that was brought up early, which is how do we make uh, the practice of law in rural communities and bring um, an access, you know, this idea of access to justice, and also the important life. You know, one of the things that's important to me is the lifeblood that a attorney in a rural community brings to that community. I was just chatting with a good friend of mine who's been practicing in Weezer. He's shutting down at the end of this year. Uh, it's one more small town with one less important lawyer practicing law, and. I think as a long-term issue, that's probably the biggest issue. Obviously, managing the pandemic, getting people in the courthouse, responding to our cultural, you know, the, these fractures that we're seeing culturally um, related to the law. All those are short-term critical problems we need to address. Um, but I think from a long-term perspective, this division that we're seeing between urban practitioners, I mean... I'm a big city boutique practitioner. I'm talking about how do we create more um, uh, general practice rural lawyers. But I, I look at the problem and say this is this is going to be something that uh, rips at the fabric of our, us as a society and a country if we don't come up with solutions to it. Whether they're the financial solutions, we've seen South Dakota has some issues, has had some approaches to it, and we're starting to look at that. We had hoped to do more during our term, but this damn virus thing. Uh, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to carry this forward with the, the next group of commissioners and, and we'll be able to put some energy into that over time. So. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Kristen Bjorkman Dunn. I'm a commissioner from the fourth district in the state of Idaho. So I live and practice in Boise. I work in private practice. Um, most of my work falls in the arenas of business and real estate. Um, do some other little things on the side, but I'd say that's most of what I do. Um, I guess my love for those practice areas came from um, almost a decade of working in-house um, corporations that did, um, you know, commercial finance, commercial real estate development, retail shopping center development, that sort of thing. Uh, early on uh, in my uh, days as a, a new lawyer, I actually clerked in, a, in the Snohomish County Superior Court. Um, so I lived in Everett and I count that as one of the greatest jobs that I ever had. Um, I thought my you know, my judge was outstanding and, and Snohomish County was an interesting place to be. Um, I have lived in a variety of different places in Idaho during my life. So I've lived in really small communities. And like I said, I currently live in Boise, which is the largest, you know, this is where the bulk of the population in Idaho is at. Uh, and I, I see that um, it's difficult in a state like ours that is so large. We cover, you know, we have so many square miles. Um, it's really hard to keep people in touch with one another. And we constantly hear as commissioners, but, but also just as lawyers living in Boise, you know, about, well, everything in the great state of Boise, um, what about what's happening for us and the rest of the state? And I think that that's one of our challenges. I would say that I echo all of the challenges that have already been, um, shared by the group, but I really do think that there's a need for us to try to make people feel like they're. A part, that we're all part of the same bar, no matter where we practice. Good afternoon. My name is Gary Cooper. Um, I represent the eastern part of the state. So that's Pocatello, Idaho Falls, Rexburg. Those are the primary communities in that portion of the state. We're a very rural portion of the state. So a lot of the problems that have been addressed about uh, getting lawyers into rural areas, those are definitely problems that I see and, and hope to be able to do something about. I grew up in Idaho. I was raised in the Boise Valley, went to the University of Idaho in Moscow, and now practiced for 46 years in eastern Idaho. Um, I do a little bit of everything, but probably... Uh, civil litigation is the main focus of, of my uh, practice. Um, I, 
I think um, kind of an adjunct of, of the problems of uh, getting uh, lawyers into uh, rural areas is that we're finding that we have fewer and fewer judges applying for the district court positions, which is the primary civil uh, uh, judges in our um, system. And part of that comes from the expense of moving to a new community, um, you know, leaving Boise and going to uh, Idaho Falls or Pocatello or some of the other communities like Soda Springs and, and uh, uh, those places is overwhelming. You can't do it. And uh, as a consequence, we have fewer uh, judges applying, fewer quality judges. And I, I think the other piece of it is, is that, that we encourage young lawyers to go to the rural areas, but we've you would think with all of the communication systems we have now, we would be closer. We're actually further apart. And um, I don't think that they feel that they have mentors, people that they can come to with problems and um, even legal issues just to discuss uh, how to, to accomplish some of those things. And I hope we can figure some of this out. I, I think it's a huge problem and it's a huge problem to the existence of uh, the legal system, really. So, thank you. So, uh, my name is Matthew Dresden. I represent uh, the District Seven North in Washington, which is uh, the northern part, northwest part of Seattle, up to Snohomish County, go Snohomish. Um, my uh, my practice. I'm a solo practice practitioner. Uh, I my primarily do entertainment work, representing filmmakers and production companies. I also do IP and some corporate work. Uh, and I'm an adjunct uh, professor at Indiana University School of Law. Um, uh, oh, the, uh, the challenge. Um, so I think the, I, might, I believe that the, the biggest challenge facing the Bar Association is the, are the court cases relating to the integrated bar. But rather than uh, go over that, I, I'd like to talk about something different, which is sort of technology and sort of the way, and I think I took that talk about a little bit with, with Zoom and, and so forth, but I think technology writ large and the ways in which it can and should be integrated into the practice, both of lawyers and the Bar Association. And it's, it, it touches so many things, access to justice, efficiency of the court system, privacy, um, and I think the, the way in which can be done intelligently, comprehensively, and hopefully in an somewhat cost-effective manner is a, is a big challenge facing a lot of lawyers. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Boyd. I uh, live in Vancouver, Washington. I represent the third district, uh, which is Southwest Washington. I'm a criminal prosecutor for the Clark County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Right now I lead our domestic violence unit um, at that office. I think that the biggest, well, I think the biggest challenge affecting our legal system probably across the country is access to justice. How do we increase it? How do we let the public know um, that they have access to justice? How do, <laughs> how do we let them know how to go about accessing justice? Um, what their perception is on whether justice is fair, I think uh, affects all of us and affects the ability um, for the, rule of law to rule our country. I have been, um, as horrible as the pandemic is, I've been a little bit encouraged by how quickly, at least I've seen in Clark County, um, the wheels of justice moving to try to keep up with the pandemic and having Zoom court, for example, we're seeing victims and defendants and litigants be able to appear in court over Zoom without taking the entire day off their work. Um, or figuring out how to get down to our court system. So I think um, while the pandemic has caused problems to the access of justice in other ways, it's taught us ways to increase it um, to the public at large. So I've been really encouraged by that. I still um, think we have a long way to go and I hope that we can continue working on these issues. And so now I'm gonna go to our uh, virtual uh, participants, and I will call out uh, names so that we can kind of keep going. And if I miss anybody, let me know. But we'll start with Executive Director Nevitt. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry that I am not with you there today. I really would have liked to be. Um, so I would say, um, if, you know, I think I'm just going to repeat a little bit. I, I do think that sort of the most immediate challenge facing the Bar Association is the litigation. Um, but I, I do, I would rather speak about you know, the bigger issue facing the profession and, and frankly, society at large is what a few people have already touched on, which is, you know, lack of confidence in the justice system um, and a perception, particularly among people of color and other historically underrepresented groups that the justice system is not fair or not for people like them. And we had a study here in Washington state a few years ago, the civil legal needs study that did find that people's perceptions of whether the justice system works for them uh, is quite distinct based on race and other identifying characteristics. So um, I think that's about access to justice, but I think it's about a lot of other bigger topics as well. Um, and I'd say that's one of the biggest threats to our profession and our society. Thank you, Executive Director Nevitt. Uh, Governor, Governor McBride. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome everyone. I'm Tom McBride. I'm from the 10th District Governor, which is South Puget Sound, probably centered around Olympia, our state capital. I grew up in Spokane, was born there, grew up there. Um, and a little bit like Kyle, my brothers and sisters and I all have a, a lake place that's uh, north of Post Falls, Idaho. So, and I have a brother in Boise and family in Idaho Falls. So I don't see the line between Eastern Washington and Idaho so clearly. Um, I went to WSU for undergraduate and University of Washington for law school. I started as a King County Deputy Prosecutor doing tort defense and then moved through the, the different criminal departments um, and ended up specializing in child abuse cases. Um, after that, I went to work for the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys uh, for a pretty long stretch of time. And now I'm working as the legislative director for the Department of Fish and Wildlife in Washington. Um, I think I agree with all the issues raised. I, I might have a slight difference of opinion on the integrated bar issue. I'm kind of open to this discussion about regulatory versus voluntary. And I'm curious if, if, if there's time and if it's appropriate, um, if you have thoughts about that um, from the Idaho Bar Association perspective. So thank you. Thank you, Governor McBride. Governor Dan Clark. Krauss, thank you. Um, I did a, a, a written thing that I'll, I'll, I'll share to read, but uh, um, yeah, I wore the best though. Yeah, I mean, for, you know, for the vandals, so to go <laughs> I, Idaho, but uh, yeah, thank you. Governor Clark, will you be emailing that to me so that I can read it? It's right here, yes. Yeah. Okay, in chat. as soon as I get it, I'll, I'll read it. Oh, it's in the chat. Here, let me read that. Scroll up. Uh, Dan Clark says, I'm the District Board Governor out of Yakima, Washington, starting on his fifth year on the board. I'm the current treasurer finishing my second term and I'm the president-elect-elect elect that will be the president-elect this fall being fiscal year 23 WSBA president. I'd like to bring up that I hope will be the Idaho State Bar and WSBA having a much more collaborative process regarding APR Rule 6 adoption in Idaho and having law clerk graduates that pass the bar in Washington have a path to become licensed in Idaho and vice versa. With the ever increasing cost of law school, our law clerk program allows for a full path to become an attorney for a total cost of $8,100 by being mentioned, mentored, I'm sorry, being mentored and working for an attorney. So I hope that we will be able to work together to help provide dual licensing and support to help increase access to justice and low bono, moderate means to serve the public in the rural areas. Oregon's also working on a um, uh, law clerk program too. And that's something that we should uh, reach out to them to, to, to assist and, and uh, help. Our law clerk program has been going on for, I think, over 100 years now. Um, and we take pride in it. Governor, uh, oh, I'm sorry, General Counsel Shankland. Hello, I'm uh, Julie Shankland. I'm the General Counsel. Um, 
I've been very impressed by the breadth and depth of all of the things that have been suggested um, as things that are um, f facing us. It seems to me that if you add those all up, what we're really facing is figuring out what is the future of the practice of law? How is it regulated? How does it happen? Who gets to do it? Who, you know, it's, it's a remarkable um, amount of opportunities and challenges. And I guess I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I think that all of the people in this room have an amazing opportunity to affect what that looks like. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that everyone is excited about, more excited about the opportunities than you are scared about the challenges. Thank you, General Counsel um, Shankland. Uh, Governor Serena Sayani. Governor uh, Sayani is our newest member of the Board of Governors. She was sworn in today by Justice Yu of our Supreme Court. Governor Sayani. Yes, I'm fully in support. Um, I think there's some amazing programming that needs to be done through this. And obviously it's, it's an important aspect of um, our bar and the services that we provide to the members and our community as a whole. So um, I think this is a really important program and I'm fully supportive of it. And tell us a little bit about you, Governor Sayani. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I am District 7 uh, South, the new governor for this district. I just got sworn in this morning. And I'm a commercial real estate lawyer in Seattle at Stokes Lawrence um, in our Seattle office. We also have a Yakima office, but I practice here in Seattle. I'm a commercial real estate lawyer. I'm a shareholder at the firm. I've been practicing for 16 years now. And um, I am you know, just joining the Board of Governors this year, excited for my service um, and active in many other boards and other organizations across this, you know, across the state through commercial real estate and the Bar Association. So, thank you, Governor Sayani. Governor Stevens. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Alex Stevens. I am uh, so the the Board of Governors has three at-large governors, and one uh, is an at-large governor for young lawyers. The other two are at-large governors. Um, uh, because a number of years ago, it was decided that we wanted to make sure that people uh, were elected to represent historically underrepresented people around this table. I am a civil rights lawyer uh, and always have been. This is my 40th year uh, in the bar. My first job, however, was as regional attorney for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And... Uh, that was around 1981, and back then my first assignment, or one of my early assignments, was to go to Idaho, and I went to Coeur d'Alene, Post, Post Falls, and Boise because of a little organization called the Aryan Nations Church, and we were uh, studying that and looking at the impact of um, white supremacy groups um, in our region, and uh, I enjoyed my visits to a beautiful state, and I had issues about being there just given what was going on. And I mention that because we turn now nearly 40 years later and the rise of hate groups uh, is continuing to spread. Things that I thought were fairly settled in the, in the area of civil rights, like voting rights, um, are now called into question. Um, and so one of my concerns is the whole issue of uh, what is germane. And I come as one of those voices to make sure we don't just think it's just about the regulations and the regulatory aspects of the bar. I'm a strong advocate for an integrated bar, but in any case, uh, Issues of justice, equality, fairness, civil rights, um, anti-discrimination and anti-racism are all germane. And if they are not, I don't know why we are here. And so uh, 
Yeah, I get on my soapbox about that, but I get concerned that the way we want to take a look at germaneness is to remove the issues that in fact our profession put in place in the first place. And so um, that is our task as if we talk about access to justice or equal justice or, or whatever, then we can't step away from those issues because those issues are prescient and growing. Thank you, Governor Stevens. Director Platchy. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Platchy, and I am the director of the Advancement Department here at the Washington State Bar Association. And our Advancement Department really focuses on uh, member services and professional development within the organization. And um, probably top of my mind, aside from the integrated bar issue and you know, some of the other things that have been mentioned, is really how we enhance member engagement within our organization and how we get members more involved with our organization. I, I, I sense that there's been a decline in that. Some of it could be accompanied by COVID, but generally that's pretty top of my mind is how we engage members and get them involved. And then the rural practice um, topic is very top of my mind. We've spent uh, a group, a few of our governors included, have spent the last 20 months kind of researching this topic in our state. And out of that came our small town and rural practice committee, which uh, by the way, our governor Hunter A. Bell will be the chair of that committee actually. And uh, we help, we'll hold our first meeting of that committee uh, in another month or so. And we're looking forward to getting to work on that. And, and it sounds like there's a lot of energy in Idaho to work on that. So uh, certainly, hopefully, we'll be looking forward to collaborate with your Bar Association on this topic as well. Thank you, Director Plachi. Chief Fingleton. Hello, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Diana Singleton and um, I'm the Chief Equity and Justice Officer at the Bar Association and also a member of the Bar as well. And part of um, the role um, the, of the work that I do uh, with our department, which is called the Equity and Justice Department, is to um, help our members and our leaders uh, deliver on our Bar's mission around cha championing justice um, in advancing diversity, equity, inclusion. So my team and I uh, do work around DEI as well as pro bono and public service and also um, initiatives around the access to justice um, work, including um, supporting one of our Supreme Court created boards, the Access to Justice Board. Um, so I look forward to seeing how we could work more closely with you. Thank you, uh, Director Singleton. Chief Garcia. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Renata Garcia. I'm Chief Regulatory Counsel. I joined the bar about six years ago. Um, I started in the MCLE department. Um, and as you know, we have comedy with uh, Idaho, Utah, and Oregon. And I always thought it was interesting that, uh, that the agreement is called the Boise Protocol. Um, Anyway, today I oversee admissions, annual licensing, MCLE, our limited license programs, and our law clerk program, which is our alternative to law school education. Um, so it'd be great to work together towards a you know, reciprocal admission agreement in the future, and maybe we'll call it the Olympia Protocol or something. Thank you, Chief Garcia. Chief Ende. Thank you, President Shaketi. My name is Douglas Ende. I'm the Chief Disciplinary Counsel at the Washington State Bar Association. And uh, I've been the Chief uh, coming on 15 years now. Uh, I am very pleased uh, to see my counterpart, Brad Andrews, uh, in the room over there. 
uh, Brad and I have crossed paths and worked together many times through our association with the National Organization of Bar Council. And I'm even more disappointed now that I'm uh, not there with you uh, in, in, in Boise so I can uh, spend some time with my uh, old friend Brad. Hey, Brad. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the frustrations of going at the end of the line in a exercise such as this is all of the cool and interesting ideas for what's challenging is, have been taken. And I, I don't wanna harp on things that have already been said. Uh, but something that I have been uh, thinking about and focusing on, um, partly through my work uh, on the ABA Standing Committee on Ethics and Professional Responsibility, is uh, um, lawyer mobility and cross-border practice, um, which has become a, an increasingly important and acute issue uh, in the, the era of, and of uh, the pandemic with the uh, increasing frequency of remote work and the ability to work from anywhere, uh, the issue of cross-border practice and what it is cross-border practice uh, has been a real focus of attention uh, and questions are certainly uh, coming up as to whether model rule 5.5, which is uh, the traditional effort to, to regulate um, cross-border practice and what is or is not the unauthorized practice of law, uh, is, is that still a viable rule, uh, which is also important for regulators and state bars because uh, the more mobility there is, the, the more complex the questions become as to who has responsibility if ethical issues and transgressions arise to, to, to deal uh, with uh, those uh, investigations and prosecutions. Thank you, Chief Ende. Director Kleinfelter CEO. Director Kleinfelter CEO, we may be on mute or we may have lost you. Let me see. She may have had to step away. No, she's trying. <laughs> well, you, you work on that, Director Kleinfelter CEO, and I'll have uh, Executive Administrator Bynum introduce herself. Executive Administrator Bynum. Uh, well, you can uh, introduce yourself just to these folks. Hi, I'm I'm Shelley. I made all your name plates. Um, I'm the executive administrator for the Board of Governors, and uh, I've been in role since uh, fall 2019, so right before COVID. So this is exciting to actually come out, uh, especially to Idaho and see people. Um, you know, I think the um, one of the biggest things that uh, that I see in the bar um, is just working with, you know, ongoing employee relations and keeping those connections between the bar and staff um, ongoing and uh, as well as um, working within our own group and developing those relationships so we can serve our members. And she made this all happen. Thank you, Executive Administrator Bynum. And then uh, Broadcast Service Manager Nolte. Hello, uh, Rex Nolte, Broadcast Services Manager with Washington State Bar. Um, I have served at the bar for 14 years. I started as a program coordinator uh, with the CLE department and was the webcast specialist and now serve as the broadcast services manager. Majority of the work we do is with the legal education department for our CLEs. We, um, all of them are available live online as well as on demand. I also attend the board meetings to make sure that all can participate. I've been here 14 years. I am not uh, a member of the legal community. I'm a member of the community. Access to justice is clearly number one that I see and hear about. Um, and I agree that it should, it should be at the forefront. We just wrapped up a three days access to justice conference along with the access to justice board, Washington State Bar Association, and many other sponsors. We held 40 sessions, over 500 attendees. Um, if you'd like to hear about some of these access to justice from our folks in Washington, please visit the WSBA ATJ YouTube page in the next couple of weeks. And, and, um, hear from directly from the folks 
experiencing these issues. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Broadcast Manager Nolte. Uh, back to Director Kleinfelter CEO. Thank you for your patience as I grappled with technology issues. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glennis Kleinfelter CEO, and I am WISBA's HR Director and Chief Culture Officer. I am the newest member of the executive team. I've been here for five months uh, and, and I've loved every minute of it. I um, am also not a member of the legal community, but I do bring 20 years of experience from the education and nonprofit sectors. I specialize in centering employee and organizational wellness through an equity intuitive lens and with compassionate leadership. So what that means is I am working to support our employees so they can provide the best possible support to our legal community and members. Thanks. Thank you, Director Kleinfelter CEO. Member engagement and member services and engagement manager, Unite. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Julianne Unite. I am the member services and engagement manager at the Washington State Bar Association. I am currently uh, under the advancement department in which Clevin, Kevin Platchy, who introduced himself earlier, is the director of. And primarily my team focuses on new member programming, mentorship, our sections portfolio, and other member benefits and services like our insurance marketplace that we offer to our members. And so lots of uh, member services and professional development uh, that my team goes forth and supports for our members, as well as the uh, STAR committee, which Kevin had also explained to you all uh, is housed under my portfolio as well. And I echo kind of everything that's been said regarding the challenges. Uh, I think uh, I am part of the legal community, but not the Washington legal community. I was licensed in Nevada, but I was born and raised in Seattle. So I have kind of this, you know, insider outsider lens. And I think one of the things really top of mind for me, especially as still considered a young lawyer uh, by a uh, general definition is uh, student loan debt and how to address student loan debt that is so insurmountable as the you know majority of our profession starts to age out and this newer profession is coming in with challenges that you know previous professionals have not faced. So that's top of mind for me on a personal level, but also on the larger macro legal community level. Thank you, Manager Unite. Did I miss anybody? I'm gonna, nobody's raising their hand, nobody's speaking up. All right, that was a, a lot of introductions, but I think it gives uh, everybody a little bit of a feel for who we are and what we do. Um, let's start, uh, President-elect. Good question. Well, let me let me do my thing here first, and then we'll I'll turn it over to you for a minute. Uh, so one of the fun things that I've found as president is to be able to go out and meet with um, uh, members all around the, the state. And COVID has put kind of a damper on that. We, we had a slow start, um, but we, um, we've been doing that in the last month or so, meeting with folks in Shelton, Washington and South Bend, Washington. We met in Coopville and, and Mount Vernon, small, small communities, um, and many of which mentioned the rural practice. And that's one of the things that we talked about here. And that might be a good um, starting point for having a discussion. Those conversations that we had started out as kind of a, more of a presentation, but they evolved into a discussion, a conversation with people that was going back and forth. And I hope that's what we can kind of experience today, not, not giving presentations, not doing a slideshow. We purposely didn't do that because we just wanted to have a, a dialogue. And so uh, President Majumdar, if you have a thought on that. Actually, I had a question for Idaho because you've been put forward as one of, one of two working models in the United States as for mandatory uh, malpractice insurance. 
the original state was Oregon and they have the public model where their bar association uh, through their fund uh, mandatorily every insurance every in, every attorney gets insurance through there no one can be denied no one can be canceled you get various services and it's it's not the highest amount of coverage but everyone has to get it and then Idaho has what we kind of term when we were talking about the, the private market model. You have to just go out and get it from the market. And we were weighing these things last year. And while I kind of love the idea of mandatory malpractice requirement, I was really scared by the idea of the private practice model because we heard testimony from some lawyers, especially solo practitioners with, with the discrete practice areas like intellectual property or litigation. They said they wouldn't be able to get insurance. And therefore, in a sense, the insurance company might be able to essentially you take over the regulation because they're de deciding who gets to, you know, and maybe the risk would just be too high for some attorneys. And I was just kind of wondering, have you run into that at all with people being able to get, not being able to get insurance and therefore get deregulated? I think we'd probably refer to defer to Maureen or Brad or Diane on that. I mean, that's going to be. Uh, I can let Brad too. Um, no, actually everyone's gotten it. Um, I think that the biggest, and, and Brad and I talked about this the other day, and he can elaborate if he wants, but the bigger issue has been people who do part-time practice. The, the getting, if you practice full-time, you're able to get it. And people have not, the first two years are a little rough, just trying to get everybody to figure out what they needed to do and how they would do it. But beyond that, not that I know of, people don't say much anymore. The bigger issue is if you're an older lawyer or somebody only wants to do one or two cases, that you still have to get it. And that's where they get caught up more than the specialty areas or the small town practice. Brad, do you wanna add anything to that? No, she's right. The answer is no. Uh, we have had nobody, nobody has called and said, I can't get uh, uh, coverage. Basically, I work with a lot of lawyers that are, for lack of a better term, on the glide path of retirement. They haven't, you know, they've, they've kept their license active, then they want to do something. Our trigger is uh, for, if you do something for private clients. A lot of times I just work with them in finding somebody to partner up with and you know, basically get a rider for a certain period of time. So even those lawyers, now some people like it because they it allows them to actually retire because they can say, I no longer have malpractice insurance. Then the only other issue that's floating around is we're at 100, 300 as the minimum limits. And there's there's been a lot of debate um, from, from all sides that it should probably be increased. But, um, and, and so there's a possibility that we will have a resolution in the future to raise the limits. But I think if if we're involved in that, we're going to sit down with the private insurers and kind of get their feelings on where they think we ought to be. Uh, and we have not, the other thing, I didn't get any feedback at all. One of the concerns we had originally was whether it, we were going to become a captive market and the insurance companies were going to be able to uh, increase prices. We have not had any complaints about that. And I have not had any lawyers calling to say it's just prohibitively expensive for me. So um, we've kind of kind of just uh, it, it's worked out well. And the questions have really died. You know, the first year there were some questions from people just where do I where do I fit in? But everybody's got it figured out now. And, and, and uh, I don't how, how many years have we had it? I think we're in fourth year and and very few inquiries. I, I specifically asked Alps today, in fact, and I will disclose that I am on the board of Alps and have been for 20 years, but um, that they, um, does it make a difference in terms of whether it's mandatory? Has it made a difference in terms of cost? And, and as they said, and I, I know having watched it for all these years, if an insurance company is doing what they're supposed to be doing and doing it right, whether it's mandatory or not is, is not relevant. It's underwriting. You know, what is the exposure in your own state? What's the claims history, you know, case history in a state? And then that determines what your insurance rates are. It has nothing to do with whether you are or not. Um, so we haven't seen any other than if you have a couple of big bad cases in your state, that's what changes your insurance rates, not so much that it's mandatory. So 
Thank you very much. And and how has been the reception now? Um, As Brad said, and Maureen talks to a lot of people also, we don't hear much. Uh -huh. We had a lot of working through the, our, our rule is very limit. I mean, it doesn't say much. So we kind of had to wing it a little bit on what does it mean? Um, Maureen and I, with the court's help and the board's help, but um, we don't get many questions. People so, just do it. And you also had a disclosure requirement at one time around 2006. We, yeah, 2006, I think, is when it went into place. And we just did that. Um, it's coming into effect, uh, I think, next month to disclose lack of insurance as a, a step toward an influencing and, and persuading more people to get insurance. Did that actually help um, Idaho? Well, only because the lawyers got confused. I mean, you know, when we did that, you had to disclose whether you did or did not have insurance. It was a form you filled out with your licensing. And some people thought it meant they had to get insurance, so they did. And we're like, okay, but that's nice. That's not what we said, but if that's what you want to do, that's all. That's okay. Huh. And if it pushed you over the edge to do so, that's all good. So, did you remember how much of a gap you were? I, I didn't think to look at those numbers up in terms of how many did. I, I think our numbers. I should know that because when we did the mandatory, I think. I want to say 70% of the lawyers ish had insurance when we went to the bar and asked about mandatory. Uh -huh. It was pretty high. Right. And I think ours was 84%. Yeah. Like, and it, it, oh, it might've been higher, but I'm thinking it was at least 70. 75, 80. Yeah. 75, yeah. 80. Good. So it was pretty minimal. Similar. Governor Williams Ruth. If I could just follow up on your, on your notice, because with our notice requirement that kicks in on September 1, it's notice to clients. It's not notice to the bar. So we, did you did Idaho have that where they had to notify their clients? No, we did okay. not. Thank you. And I know South Dakota, many states did that instead. No, we just told, they had to tell us. And if somebody called, we would tell them, but you had to ask the question. Governor Grubicki. Um, When we tried to um, enact mandatory malpractice insurance, we tried to do it at the Board of Governors level. As I recall, Idaho did it by referendum, correct? We do everything that way. We don't and, have a choice. Everything has to go to the membership first. And um, was was that in the form of a proposal from the commissioners, or was it something a groundswell from the populace? It was from the president of the bar at the time, but the commissioners did not put their name on it. She put it out there herself, and she it was pretty much without a lot of there was no task force. There was nothing. She put it out to the membership, and honestly, I told Marie. <laughs> I didn't think about it a lot and I didn't even think about how it was going to work because it never occurred to me it would pass. And it did. And the court said yes. Yeah, I think our our problem was that um, because we were doing it at the Board of Governors level, this let um, a small group of complainers, people who didn't want to buy insurance, uh, raise a ruckus. And um, we ended up doing this fallback where we got to notify the client in writing. Um, I suspect that if we had done a referendum in our state, since 85% of the people are covered, they always said, well, sure, everybody ought to have insurance. And, and we, that, that's part of the reason it did pass is because people who already had it thought, well, why shouldn't the other people? I would, that I think is what put it over the edge. It was a pretty close call, but is that people already had it. They figured everything we do as a bar of a rule change, take a position, do anything has to go to the membership first. We don't have a choice. The board doesn't get to make those decisions on their own. The court doesn't even do it on their own. They wait for the bar to say, we want this, or the bar voted on this and they said yes, and so we're moving to that space. So we don't do it. There isn't that really an option. I think that's a lesson for us on some issues. <laughs> yeah. And, and this was, and these yeah, they're like, wait, we didn't have to have insurance? They, like, they didn't understand <laughs> what we were voting on. <laughs> we actually have that too. We we have a lot of people who think it is mandatory already in Washington, um, and be curious to see what would happen with a referendum. And the public doesn't understand it. You don't like it. The public is completely surprised. You talk to anyone that's in the public, or you talk to people that are doctors, or they think, "Are you kidding me? You people really don't have to have insurance." It's surprisingly, the general public and the people in other professions were completely shocked that lawyers don't have to have it. Governor Knight. So do you recall about what the split was on the vote of the members? Was that a... It was close. It was 51, okay. 50 something percent. It was it was a very close vote. I can't remember what the percentage that voted. I, I'd have to go look that one up. 
Yeah, that's very interesting because we've been, it's recently, for the last four or five years, it's been a hot topic for mandatory malpractice, but it's been a topic for decades with Washington. It pops up every once in a while. It was hot in the 80s. It was even presented in the 60s, and uh, we'll see it again, I'm sure. We've uh, had some discussions with Oregon's model to see if we could borrow their model to bring it to Washington. Um, that uh, didn't hasn't gone anywhere, but it's an interesting idea. Um, and you're big enough to do so. We weren't. No. We don't have enough. Our population of lawyers is not large enough to have that model mm -hmm. unless we pair partnered with someone else. Well, that's interesting because some of what we've been talked to them about is perhaps Washington is too large. It doesn't. It may not work with somebody that's <laughs> twice the size of of Oregon. Um, and who knows? That might be true. That might not be. I don't know. Any other discussion about mandatory malpractice insurance? Any other burning questions? Well, Governor Knight. Not directly about mal mandatory malpractice insurance, but it raised one issue. So every single issue that goes to the membership in, in Idaho. The, if we want to the, change a rule, yes. The, the Board of Commissioners doesn't vote on anything. They can vote to submit it to the membership, but it does not go to the court. So how often are there these referendums? We, we, we run the process every year. Okay. It's, it's a process in place every year. Some years we don't have resolutions, but if we do, um, they do that. And like our license fees, to change license fees, we have to go to the membership first, then to the court, then to the legislature. So we don't do that very often. Sure. Governor uh, Peterson. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a really interesting idea. Um, how do you, how does it work? Or how do you guys feel it works for your state? Uh, like one of you guys <laughs> I, I think it works quite smoothly. Maybe it is because there's only maybe 6,000 of us right now. And, but we travel around the state, meet in every district. Every district has a meeting, has a vote at the meeting it, that people can attend, that the commission presents at. You know, the, uh, uh, referendums can be brought by members of the bar, can be brought by organizations, can be brought by the commission. The commission can say, we support this one and encourage you to vote for it. It's like, like uh, a board of directors, <laughs> things that you get for companies you've invested in. We want you to support it. Um, there's somewhere where it's like hands off. I think this one was a hands off one we're talking about. There's somewhere, you know, you talk to a commissioner and the commissioners are going, no, stay away from that. You got some wackadoo who is trying to push something, right? So it's like any other electoral process um, that goes through and recognize it has to get, uh, if it gets approved by the bar, the court still has to say yes or no. There are things that have passed. The bar has said yes. We had one that's the last the couple time, of years. That's the only time that's ever happened. Where, where the where the bar sixty percent said yes, and the court said we're not going to adopt that rule. So it happened. Yeah. So in the years that I've been there, we've had one time where the court did not adopt that rule, and it was eight point four G. So that was a controversial. Again, the the quiet, you know, the smaller group got, um, and there've been one time that they adopted a rule without us. It was in our bar commission rules, which is the regulatory rules, and that had something to do with. On their court filing system, but nothing to do with anything. The uh, the wackadoo part. Uh, <laughs> President elect Holzer speaks the same language as Governor Grabicki. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Gr Dresden. I, I grew up in Texas, so. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Gr Dresden, and then Governor Peterson. Uh, yeah, just following up the uh, the election. Or process, uh, what sort of turnout do you get and what, what sort of process do you use for the election? Is it all electronic? It's still paper. <laughs> um, we do either, you can vote in person at the meeting or we just send ballots to everyone. Um, I think we can do electronic. We have not for done for this particular thing yet, but we haven't had, we do our commissioner elections now electronically. We haven't had a resolution for the last couple of years. So if we do have any this year, I think we'll have to try to figure out how we go about that. And, and what's the turnout at these elections? Um, depending on the issue, anywhere from ten to fifteen to thirty to forty to thirty to forty percent. I mean, we can we've gotten up to half the people voting. Usually, it's more like twenty to thirty percent. Governor Peterson. Yeah. Do you feel that that makes the members feel more included and um, makes you maybe potentially have a more active bar? And then, I guess the second question. Our, our, our audience, apologize. You're, good. You're back. 
had some <laughs> technical issues, but we're talking to, we're talking now about an exciting issue for me because I had an article just a couple uh, months ago in our bar news about uh, it was titled a, a home of our own, and it looked back into our history back in the 1950s when we created our Washington Law Foundation specifically to purchase a building. And that was in the 50s, and then the 60s came along, and the 70s, and they started renting. And now our lease in downtown Seattle comes due in 2026. So we're exploring the idea of, of perhaps a building or other ideas. But we know that California has two buildings. We know Texas has its own building. Oregon has its own building. And now we understand you have your own building. That would be exciting to, to hear about your perspective on that. And Nevada has one, too. In Nevada. Right. You're wrapping the last question. Go, go. You want to yes. ask your question? Or... Yeah. Can, can people hear me? Okay. So the question, I mean, they were talking about, you know, it sounds, and you can clarify this maybe too in your answer, but that the, the bar, the members of the bar actually make all the decisions. Um, and so my question being is it would seem, because I'm, I'm on the membership work group for the Washington State Bar Association. So we're always looking for ways to, get feedback from the members and get them more involved. And so the question to you was, it, it seems, um, you know, I think about it just from a theoretical sense that that would invigorate your, the members of your bar. They'd feel like they're more part of it. They feel like they have a say, they'd be more active. Cause that's one of the biggest problems we have. I would say in the Washington State Bar Association is like, oh yeah, I don't know. Some governor somewhere made this decision, right? Or the, or the Supreme Court made the decision, right? But like, you know, there's no reason for us to get involved because it's just gonna, it's just gonna happen to us and we'll pay our dues. And, you know, as long as we don't get disbarred, you know, we'll all live happily ever after, which is fine. Um, so so I guess the, the, the first part of the question is what are the, what have you seen as the pros of doing that? But then, you know, if we were to consider something like that, you know, what, what have you guys seen as the cons? Um, because, you know, I guess, you know, I guess, you know, if I was thinking about it, um, not having heard your answers, obviously, is, you know, is there any fear from, you know, the commissioners and the bar, you know, the, the members, you know, the staff and people with the Idaho Bar Association that, boy, if we let the members decide this, who knows what they might decide, right? So um, anyway, that, that's, that, those are kind of my, my questions. I, I, I've been appointed the head of the family feud to answer the question. So the, the, the first part is it just may be a, a little bit better understanding of our resolution process. It's primarily rules, which are bar commission rules, which are you know, uh, the rules that, that govern many of our programs and the rules of professional conduct. We occasionally ask policy type questions, but they're limited to, should we have another federal judge or things of that nature? So occasionally it'll be an advisory issue. There are one time the lawyer's assistance program uh, threw out an advisory issue on whether there should be discipline with each DUI. They got shot down and, and, and a rule didn't, didn't. So it's not all policy decisions. The board handles the policy decisions. Um, these, now, the cons are it's a little bit, we're not nimble. You know, it, it takes some time. The rules and the resolutions stack up for our, our, our uh, fall road show. The, along with that though is a positive and that is it's more deliberative. We often have task force or, you know, committees work on a specific rule, bringing in um, various members from the bar and the court that are interested in the rule and so when we present a rule, it's kind of got buy-in. We've had one rule, for example, we had both the Prosecutors Association and the Defense Association both supported the rule. So that was kind of a no-brainer. So there's, so that's, that, that's uh, you know, there's, there's not many cons um, other than the, you know, if you need something right away, you, you have to wait, wait a bit. Um, it does, it does, we go to these meetings and people there, there, we, we give awards and we do resolutions. It's a nice way to meet with everybody in every district. And I think that you, you know, while some of the votes are in the 30% range, uh, a lot of votes you know, on something that's controversial, you see the membership 
rise and, and the voting levels rise. So it does keep people involved and they do have a sense that, that you know, they do have ownership in major decisions and they don't feel like it's top down, it's coming from our, our membership. So it's a, it's a bulky process, but it also, the, the final pro is it helps us with these issues of integrated bars that, that, that everybody's discussing is that we go to our bar. And so we don't, we don't issue decisions where they might say, well, now you're in the non-germane or, and so most of them are clearly within the, the scope of that decision, germane issues that we're asking them about, but it helps, it helps us keep on track on germane issues and, and they buy into that. And, and they do feel that they, when you vote, you feel like you have, um, uh, you have some, um, some stake in the game when the rule does pass, so. Hey, Brad, can I add just a little bit yeah. to what you mentioned? Because I, I would agree with everything that you've said. I would just kind of explain a little bit more about what's happening at this roadshow resolution process. So the commissioners travel the state of Idaho. We visit each of our districts and we talk about the resolution that's been proposed. And so there's this, we're all there together. So the entire board of commissioners goes. Um, and so, you know, you might be thinking, gosh, do people actually show up for this or is it a big empty room? We do a number of things, I think, to help encourage attendance. So not only do all of the lawyers in the district understand that we're going to talk about the resolution, but it's an opportunity for them to actually get to talk to the leadership of the bar face to face. Um, and so I think that that encourages folks to come out. The other thing is, is that um, they get the chance to actually see you know, the people that they practice with in their district in a completely different context, you know, where we're visiting about what it is that we do internally versus, you know, those things where we get together because we've got a CLE or something. I mean, you know, we're all kind of sharing this in common, regardless of our practice area. And, you know, having been um, in leadership at the, at the district level, you know, not just in my leadership on the board of commissioners, but, you know, we would try to do things in, in the, in our district to encourage people to turn out by, you know, saying, gosh, maybe in addition to that, we'll have a meal and maybe we'll have a half hour CLE or a 45 minute CLE. Um, so we were conscientious of trying to not take up too much of a person's time, but also offer, um, a variety of reasons that you might want to be in attendance um, in addition to talking about the resolution. And I think having, you know, practiced for a fair number of years now, I have always felt like this process, it, it felt very inclusive. I mean, when the commissioners come around and travel and visit with you face to face, you really do feel like you're an important part of the conversation um, and you have the opportunity to ask questions um, and the commissioners will, you know, I mean, it's a dialogue while we're there. So anyway, thanks. I just wanted to add a little bit to what Brad said. And just to add one more piece of what we do at those meetings, we also do uh, recognitions and acknowledgments of, of attorneys, professionalism awards, service awards. So that, uh, that also encourages people, particularly, you know, the senior lawyer at a firm is showing up, all the young lawyers show up. It's one of the funnest things to do as president is hand out those awards. One of the things that I've thought about, and again, one of my articles addressed this, is um, Oregon has a house of delegates, 400 people who come together, and it's a lot of people, but you get in a lot of buy-in from the membership, and some things that were once controversial aren't controversial anymore. We've had a, like getting back to the, the issue that I'd really like to talk to you about, the, the building and the uh, location of the bar in Oregon, it was toward Portland for the longest time, and most of Oregon didn't like the fact that it was Portland-centric. And so then they got together and moved it about 30 miles south to Tigard, bought a building, and the conversations about, you know, being in Portland or moving to Salem just disappeared. And it was partly because of the move, but also partly because of this group of people who discussed it in, a, in the House of Delegates, and they all kind of agreed, and by consensus. Um, and then I think it's helped with mandatory malpractice insurance. It's helped with uh, fees. 
the fees in uh, Oregon are, I think, six ninety now a year, and and they pay thirty five hundred dollars for the PLF insurance. Um, but I think that through that body of uh, discussion and uh, there's buy in, and and then there's you know it's not the top down as as you mentioned, it's it's uh, you know us making these decisions, not from Board of Governors, something to think about. Governor um, Williams Ruth and then Governor Grabicki. Thank you, Mr. President. I would love to just drill down a little more because I was looking at your website about your membership count. And just to help, because I'm not sure other members of our board are aware that your total membership of in state attorneys is 3,949 as of August 2nd. Is that correct? The That's the active. Yeah, the and that there are 1,357 out of state. So do when you're doing your roadshow, do you do, how do you engage your out of state members? Oh, there's a good question. We don't yet. Okay. Because I'll, cause like, I mean, just because I'm well, on they, can, our they, they get invited, they get invited and they can yeah. vote. They get the ballot like everybody else, whether they want to come like the Spokane people will come. You know, if somebody's from Spokane, they will come over or, or another Pullman or, 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 you know, if they're from a close place, but from there from far away, they can vote, you know, on the ballot. They just, it, it, they'd have to come to go to the right. meeting um and we haven't because we didn't do it last year obviously so you know we haven't done any virtual we could do that so because i because like with with our organization and i serve on what we call our nominations committee where we try to fill in the members to serve on various committees is that we're already at like 1200 people who are volunteers to the bar association itself and so because i heard you say that there was like 15 percent engagement on the resolutions and so using just, if that includes out of state members, we're looking at like 800 people voting. So I just wanna make sure our board is understanding that with a bar of 42,000. It's a very different thing. It's it's a lot different that it, because again, I, I've actually been talking with President Shaketi about move, like trying to look at how we could do a more board of delegates. Because as you heard from Governor Stevens, we have two at large spots, which are supposed to be historically underrepresented, but then to try and have someone represent and, and be, you know, speak for all historically underrepresented really doesn't work out as where if we had a board of or a house of delegates type situation where every organization in our state, whether it's the Spokane bar, the Tacoma Pierce County bar, or all, all of the various legal entities would have a, a seat in this other house, that would be more of a way to have right. where it's not just this small group of 14 people, but having an area. So other than the resolutions and the rules, is there anything else that, that you go directly to the membership for? We have local bars. There's seven, which are, are entities of the Idaho State Bar. They're not independent. We have no independent local bars. And so yes, the, the bar commissioners go to the two events there. Um, but your 42,000 is your total membership. Correct. It's not active in state. Our Correct. total membership is like seven thousand. Right. So I mean, you're, th those aren't apples to apples in terms of your numbers. That's all I'm saying. Right. Right. But you're right. It, it is it, as large as you are. You'd have to structure something differently, obviously, to do what you're talking about. I, I think I would talk to Oregon about their House of delegates and see what they think. One of the other things that Oregon does, and I talk a lot about Oregon because I'm so close to Oregon, and <laughs> I've been a member of that, that bar for 25 years, and they give me a bad time about it, but they do a lot of the interesting things, and one of them is just, I think, six years ago, they made, they created a governor for out-of-state attorneys, and they were typically in Washington or California is where they're coming from, but um, it was a very interesting idea for getting uh input from the out-of-state attorneys do you all do that we don't do that it, it, we're probably getting to that point in our case too i mean yeah over a thousand yeah we've talked about it off and on over the years but that i mean there, that's a bigger issue than just out of state it's every district doesn't i mean in our case and in every case that becomes way more than do we want a governor from out of state uh -huh. so it, it's an issue that probably needs to be addressed one of these years yeah yeah and, and for all maybe us. maybe for us too right? when i did the survey on that a few years ago because the board asked that question or somebody asked that question um the majority of the states did not have one and i think it's moved away from that since then mm -hmm. governor grubecki oh, Kyle, let's first remember that in Oregon, you can't pump your own gas. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, I have two um, areas of inquiry. First of all, um, can you tell us how the Idaho Bar Foundation 
raise the money necessary to make the down payment uh, to purchase the building? The Idaho Law Foundation bought the building in 1975 mm -hmm. and they raised $30,000 from lawyers um, to buy the building. And it was a house in, in downtown Boise that cost $80,000. We sold it for 300 and some thousand, built our building in 1993. We again raised up about 200,000 to build the building that we have. Um, a lot from members, a lot from the sale, then obviously the sale of our old building. So the, they did a fundraiser both times too. Um, but we had the same, somebody wanted to buy a building, form a foundation to buy a building and a very nice tax lawyer said, you can't do that. If you're gonna be, have a foundation, it has to have a purpose. So the foundation was sort of the secondary piece. Um, our building's probably worth two or $3 million now because it's downtown. And they will, and it had, we have our own parking lot. Um, <laughs> and we owe 250,000 on it. It's probably worth five. Well, it could be worth five. Now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last time somebody asked me the question, but you're right. <laughs> my, my, Kurt's, Kurt's office is across the street from ours, so he would know. <laughs> my second inquiry um, has to do with um, legislative activity. Um, how does the Idaho State Bar uh, deal with um, legislative issues that um, lawyers have special knowledge of? Or do you? Run away? <laughs> we don't, for the most part. If lawyers are asked by the legislature or sections of the bar to give technical assistance, like here's what this means, not take a position, they can do that. Beyond that, we really don't. And if it does need to go to the legislature, again, it has to go through the resolution process. We so. For instance, if um, uh, if a legislator uh, in Idaho uh, came up with um, an idea to radically change your family law practice divorce mm -hmm. um, in a manner that was uh, would shock the family lawyers, um, would uh, the um, family law section be able to go and testify against it? No, basically no. They can as individual lawyers they could, but not as a section of the bar. It's the rules, right? So you don't, you you probably don't have the exposure that Texas had in the Longley case. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Governor Knight. I just want to follow up a little bit on the discussion that uh, Governor Williams Ruth was having about number of total members as it relates to the size of your your board. Uh, we have 14 governors plus three officers. Uh, that's significantly less than states like Oregon. I'm imagining it's significantly more than Idaho. Can you talk about how many how many people do you have on your board and does that size work? Five? That's okay. You yeah. got four of them here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have seven districts and because of the population of the districts, to have it even, we have uh, two commissioners who represent the fourth district where Boise is. We have, and then the other three each represent two districts. So I represent the first and second in the north, and Gary represents the sixth and seventh, which is the Idaho Falls, Pocatello area. And then Laird, who's not here, has um, what Bryn has the <laughs> cobbled together the third and the fifth that lie on other either side of. Uh, the Boise Fourth District, and and we are the smallest board in the country by a long shot. The bar commissioners here, um, but it, the the size of a board, if you do the percentage research on it, has nothing to do with how many bar members. Montana has eleven or fifteen, so it, it it's not in most cases not related to how many members it has. It's uh, we are just unique, and it has nothing to do with membership. I don't think. So if it's not if it doesn't if it's not connected to number of members, what do you think five is an ideal size? Would you have more? Would you have less? You all answer that one. <laughs> yeah, it depends yeah. on who you ask. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll just tell you as a, as a, as somebody that represents the board i think five is is perfect <laughs> I, I, no I, I i mean it it is an easy we are we talked about maybe being less nimble on the resolution we could this this board can move and we can get things done 
because of the size and because of the, uh, the the ability to to get five people in a room and 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 get the work done. So, I mean, three would be probably better, but <laughs> but, but yeah, but I I mean, it, I, I would say I would say this in in you know the issue for a broader board is you get a broader range of perspectives. I think one of the things my experience has shown me in the time on this small board is we work very deep to make sure that the perspectives are brought into the room, recognizing we're a small group. And I think that that in talking to prior commissioners, I think that is a historically true. Now, does that mean that all voices have always been heard? All ideas were always there. Everything was always vetted in every decision. Of course not. But I don't think on balance, it works very well. I guess is the short answer. So, yeah, right. I mean, I think that that's a good point. That obviously a smaller board may be more nimble, um, but there's there's pros and cons to that. You know, it, you probably are not getting every perspective as as you could get, but you may be able to get those from from other places. Um, I'm wondering how that impacts you know the time commitment of the volunteers that you have serve on serve as commissioners. Um, how how many meetings do you have a year? How what is the time commitment of your volunteers in this role i i think you know yeah. oh i'm sorry were you gonna answer i was just gonna say it's around 300 hours a year yeah i i'm gonna put this on diane because when i, yeah, that's what when, I, I when i told diane that i was thinking about running and i wanted to know the answer to that question she said it's a lot of time it's probably about 300 hours a year so we probably meet almost every month i mean maybe there's been one month where we had something and we didn't meet but we meet monthly um those meetings last for half a day sometimes a full day depending on what we're doing we may have the need to get together in between meetings um to maybe to talk about something where we've got a short turnaround maybe on a disciplinary matter where we've got to issue um a decision and the rules require us to make a decision within a certain period of time so we may have to do something quickly um in a scenario like that I mean, we have hearings, we have our road show takes up, you know, if we're going to travel to every district in the state, you can't do that and have meetings um, without it taking some time. So we didn't get to do that last year, but a couple of years ago when we did get to do it, it's, uh, um, you know, that takes up a couple of days a week over a course of time, but it's, it's a big commitment, but it's not a huge commitment. I've certainly had things that have eaten up a lot more of my time that was a, that were a lot less satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, and if you're from one of the corners like I am or Gary is, I mean, you, you don't fly anywhere or you, you know, it's like, well, now as of Wednesday, I can fly from Moscow to Boise, but normally I have to fly through Seattle or drive to Spokane to get to Boise. And I don't even try to fly to Idaho Falls. I don't know if anybody does or Pocatello. You drive everywhere, right? I drive everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I drove to come here. So. Yeah, I've found um, from Vancouver, it's just as easy to drive and get there about the same right. than to fly to Spokane or Seattle. Going through the, the uh, airport in Portland is miserable and Seattle's miserable and and Spokane's good. I like Spokane, but the rest of them, it just takes just as much time to get into your car and drive that that map. <laughs> I was in I was in uh, Shelton uh, two days ago and I was on my way to meet with the um, with the local uh, members and a state trooper pulled me over, gave me a ticket and then I was I was talking to the members and uh, this was in very small South Bend, so there's about five people there. And afterwards, I'm just kind of talking with them, and they asked me, well, how was your drive up? And I said, well, except for the speeding ticket, it was fine. And he says, well, that's the judge right there. You should talk to her. <laughs> and so then they got interested in it. They said, go get the ticket. Oh, let's look at this. And <laughs> so, that's all right. I'll pay it. I'll pay it. It's fine. <laughs> Any other questions? We're doing really well. We got about uh, eight minutes, um, and we can go a little bit over. I think dinner is at five thirty. I hope that... you guys have a chance to ask us questions. You just said something really fascinating to all of us. <laughs> we're firewalled off from discipline. So as soon as you said we have to get together and make some kind of decision about discipline, that I think all of our ears just went up like that. That, that was that was a misstatement. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Admissions. Um, 
they, they do have jurisdiction over admissions. They feel the, the one that Kristen's referring to did feel a lot like discipline okay. uh, because it was probably worse, but, uh, <laughs> but that. yeah, no, uh, the, this, this board sits, this board sits as a hearing, they, they are a hearing committee for um, disciplinary cases uh, that if after the character and fitness committee makes their determination, then the board makes a determination. If the applicant is dissatisfied with the board's determination, we have a, a show cause hearing and the board sits in that capacity. Those do have deadlines associated with those. Can I ask a follow up on that? I'm just curious, just because I, I came from the character and fitness board before joining here. Does your who who is your ultimate decider for your for Idaho character and fitness? Is it your Supreme Court or is it you? Supreme Court. Because with Washington, the character and fitness board itself only makes a recommendation to the Supreme Court, and then they do what the Supreme Court is going to do. Character and fitness committee makes recommendations to the board of commissioners. The board of commissioners make recommendations to the Idaho Supreme Court. Yeah, and our, our, we are completely out of that process. It literally goes character and fitness directly to the Supreme Court. I, I had a question, because yeah. as I mentioned before, I, I come from law school side. What kind of interaction, if any, do you have with the law schools in uh, Washington? That's a great question for Executive Director Nevitt. <laughs> Well, um, we meet with the deans of the three law schools annually, and that usually happens in September. So actually we've reached out to get that set up for next month. Um, we also uh, interact with the law schools um, annually in a number of different ways. Um, I, some folks from our admissions team go to talk to law schools about the admissions process, including character and fitness. There's always a lot of questions about that. Um, we have different folks who go out to talk about professionalism. Um, usually the executive director and the president are invited to address students um, as part of orientation. And then in addition to that, sort of a, um, a not super well-known relationship we have is that um, each law school has sort of a, a WISBA liaison or a, a WISBA representative, a student. Um, and so Kevin and his team um, pass along information to them so that they can sort of liaise with their uh, with their fellow classmates. I believe we also um, send copies of our magazine to the law schools so that they can track what's going on. Um, I think those are the primary ways. Did, does anyone else on the team want to mention anything I forgot? I might add on this past year, we were um, coordinating with the uh, the law schools a little bit. I coordinating is not the right word, but uh, talking with them, of course, about diploma privilege and, and issues of concern to their students and whether that was appropriate or not. Um, and then following the, the diploma privilege that was granted, uh, whether it was to be continued on and not. And so we had conversation, I had conversations with the deans of all three law schools of, about those issues. Um, and that was a, a discussion point for quite some time. Governor Grubicki. Um, In addition, as we've been working on this um, uh, rural practice issue, uh, recruitment um, uh, for rural practice, which has been going on, as uh, Kevin said, for over 20 months um, and has resulted in the uh, formation of a standing committee, all three law schools in Washington had um, uh, somebody um, working on that um, committee. And um, coming out of that, Lori Powers at Gonzaga will be a permanent member of um, the, um, what do we call it, the STAR Committee? Yeah, the STAR Committee going forward. And I think somebody from either the U or um, Seattle U is also going to be on there. And uh, having somebody from the law school who deals with placement um, uh, really um, is helpful in terms of the insight that we get as to um, what to do with the problem and um, how to solve it. Oh, and I, I think Diana's going to mention a huge partnership that I neglected to mention, which is the Modern Means Program. <laughs> so go ahead, Diana. Yeah, so I was just going to mention uh, there's a number of other things. So one is our moderate means program, which is a partnership between the Bar Association and the three law schools in Washington. 
um, that we uh, manage a lawyer referral service basically for people of moderate means. And so the law schools have staff attorneys who supervise law students who do intakes uh, of folks that are looking for an attorney who's willing to offer reduced um, sliding scale fees and a few number of um, practice areas. And then also um, we have a diversity committee that is has a number of Board of Governor members and is co-chaired uh, by a BOG member as well as non-BOG members. And that committee historically has had um, a close relationship with the Washington State Law Schools um, specifically to partner with them on promoting diversity, um, their diversity efforts, diversity and inclusion efforts in the law schools, um, and just providing a uh, resource and support for students who are from underrepresented groups. Um, and then our pro bono and public service committee, um, they also have a relationship with the law schools and their pro bono work um, just to make sure that they're also working hand in hand. And there was one last thing that I forgot, and there's probably other things I forgot, but we also provide some, um, we also uh, provide comps, so basically free opportunities for law school, law students to attend some of our uh, continuing legal education programs. Other questions? Oh, Governor May. Uh, so one other thing just reminded me that we were discussing that we wanted to talk about oh, in 2020 Washington granted diploma privilege to graduates of any law school, meaning they didn't have to take the bar exam to become lawyers. I don't think that happened in Idaho. You allowed it to happen online, the, the exam. Is that right? Uh, the there was an effort by some students and the law school deans to ask for diploma privilege in Idaho, but our court rejected that. The court did authorize us to administer the October online exam. In addition to, we did give an in-person July, 2020 bar exam. And for 2021, is there any discussion of um, sort of doing away with the bar exam or is that not something you're discussing in Idaho? Um, I, you know, we've talked about it periodically with the court, you know, in February 2021, we had to go back with the court because again, the decision was, are we going to give the test online or in person, both options were available. Um, so the court said, um, give it online for that mm -hmm. test in July 2021, we gave it in person, but each time we've talked to them about the issue, you know, other things that I know Washington considered temporary lowering of the passing score. Our court was not um, interested in going in those directions. I know a couple states uh, like Georgia is sort of studying the bar exam. Um, New York, their voluntary bar association recently came out against the uniform bar exam and thinks that they should test more local law. So there's definitely, um, I think the pandemic brought out a, an, an undercurrent of dissatisfaction with the bar exam. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the National Conference of Bar Examiners is in the midst of a multi-year long study of the bar exam. And they've had a task force, they've made recommendations for this, they call it the next gen bar exam and rolling that out in 2025, 2026. So in our court, um, you know, two or three of the justices attend conferences, talk about the bar exam and they're supportive overall of a bar exam as a licensure path for lawyers in Idaho. And they seem positive about the next gen bar exam but not getting rid of that as how you become licensed. Thank you. Any other questions for us? We've been asking a lot. So on your rural practice or star group or whatever that's called now, that's um, yes, you all seem a little confused. <laughs> um, have you gathered up a lot of information for that in terms of what you've done? And yeah, okay. Who's in, is there somebody, I, I was thinking it'd be helpful for us to get that information because it's something we, we're kind of behind yeah. on you are where you are on that. And it'd be really helpful for us to see what information you have. So we're going to put a group together with some court. Anyway, that would be very helpful if you have that. Governor Abel um, is the chair oh, right. of that uh, committee. Right. Yeah, that, I was going to say that, but uh, Governor Abel, who's not with us today, he's with his family, is the chair of that committee. Um, he was working with 
Gonzaga Law School. Um, um, is, is it Miss Fox? Is it Miss Fox at Gonzaga? Powers, you know, Fox. Working with her closely to get it going. And then we launched it, I think, in April. But uh, Director Platchy, could you add some substance to that? Yeah, I can give some context to that. Um, Julianne and I worked with the an internal and external uh, rural practice project team over the past 20 years. Uh, Governor Grabicki was part of that as well, and Governor Abel. What we did originally is sent a survey to all rural practitioners in our state to get feedback. And we're happy to share this information if you would like, like it shared with you. And then once we got the survey results, we actually made phone calls to rural practitioners. And those phone calls ranged anywhere from 45 to an hour and a half minutes long, uh, gathering information about their practice, what barriers do they face, how are new attorneys integrated in if they come, what's their experience, how long do they stay, all of those kind of, it was a very structured interview with our rural practitioners. And they were all very, uh, excited to help and to answer questions. So we um, compiled all of that information. We also outreach to um, legal service providers. We outreach to prosecutors offices in rural communities who, by the way, are facing the same problems really that, that uh, private practice is facing is recruiting uh, rural okay. attorneys and keeping them even with those jobs. Uh, so we've got a lot of data, and Julianne has put a link in the chat to our website that captures some of those resources, but we'll, we'll, we're happy to share those with you, and we can get those to you, Diane, if you would like. One of the interesting things for me during this uh, listening to her a couple of days ago was we were talking to rural practitioners, and in South Bend, I don't, I don't know how big South Bend, but it's a tiny, tiny town. Um, we were talking to two judges and a couple of prosecutors. And they said, well, you know, this access to justice thing really isn't an issue for us um, because we, you know, the, the people around here volunteer their time. We take care of it. There's always somebody willing to help. It's the retention, keep recruiting and retention of people to come to places like South Bend and, and uh, Raymond and uh, these Shelton and other areas where I guess people, maybe it's pay, maybe it's student loans, maybe it's a combination of many things, but that was their biggest uh, concern. So I want to come in again, coming from the student point of view, um, what I've been looking at is getting students to these areas. Um, and recently I was thinking maybe it's just an Instagram account if I could just train all the rural <laughs> lawyers to go out and take pictures at yeah. dawn. And <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then show them how, <laughs> how great their communities are. But I mean, before the pandemic, I was looking at getting just cars or a bus and, and putting a CLE and down in Grangeville or Orofino, in, which is in North Idaho. Um, and so a CLE to attract lawyers and uh, maybe an open house for the firms in the area to, to put something together and bringing students down just to show them the area and communicate with practitioners. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think we are, you guys are, you know, down the road a little bit. Some other states are a little further down the road. I would say we are still painting our starting line. We're not really, you know, we are at the very beginning. And so Kevin, all that data, everything you have is something that's worth looking at. We have one of our Supreme Court justices. She is very She's definitely very interested, comes from a rural practice herself. So we've got a ways to go, but this is, will all be helpful. I was uh, here about a year ago in a mediation in Boise, and uh, my client was talking about an egg toss in Grangeville. Is there, <laughs> have you done it? <laughs> the, the mediator and my client were going back and, oh, have you, have you gone to the egg toss? Of course, everybody's gone to the egg toss. We have to find out more information about this egg toss. <laughs> Governor uh, Grabicki, followed by Governor uh, William Drew. 
when we were um, starting to develop our information about uh, the rural practice issue, um, one of the things we found out that was an impediment was the um, graduating law student might be interested in going to Ritzville or um, uh, Davenport or whoever, um, but um, his or her significant other or spouse may have no interest whatsoever. And the other thing we found was that if the kid didn't come from a rural setting, it was very unlikely that he or she would be comfortable in the, or think they're gonna be comfortable in the rural setting and they'd be resistive to doing it. And the, the irony was um, the lawyers we were talking to who were desperate to recruit um, young lawyers had very good practices. I mean, if, if these kids would go there, they'd make lots of money. Um, and so uh, when we were talking with Lori Powers at Gonzaga, we, one of the, several of the steps that we talked about was one, um, going into the high schools in these rural areas and talking to kids about what it's like to be a lawyer and how you become a lawyer and what the advantages are to being a lawyer. Because it's the kid from that town that comes back who will stay. And then secondly, in college, uh, doing the same thing at Gonzaga or Seattle U or the University of Washington or at Idaho, um, uh, probably by their sophomore year when they're starting to get serious about a major, um, going in there and talking to them about what it would be like to be a lawyer, what it's like to go to law school and all that. And then thirdly, having the um, uh, admissions and placement people at the law school identify the kids that are coming in that are from rural areas and work on them because uh, they're the most likely candidates to go back. And um, uh, that's, that's part of the process I think we're going to develop going forward. Yes, I just, I just took a, I'm sorry, no, no. I jumped the line. Yeah, I just took a kid from Riggins, which is this big, and got him placed in St. Mary's, which is this big. <laughs> it's like, yay, success, but it's like one at a time. It's, Governor Williams Ruth, followed by Executive Director Nevin. Thank you. I'm just a really data-driven governor, and I one of the things I enjoy from Director Nevitt's report that she sends us is we have a two-page report that breaks down everything from, like, we have one member who was admitted to the bar in 1946, and it goes through um, years of membership, type of practice. Is there, do you guys break down your, your statistics that way too, or? Um, we don't keep years of practice. Yes. Gender, age, statistics about how, where they practice, how many, how old everybody is. We have all that. We do not have what kind of practice. We don't gather that information on our licensing stuff. Now we could figure it out, but we don't gather it aggregate. It was just fascinating. Like as an estate planning attorney, I know that I'm competing against 3,302 others, um, because we, we have all, we have years licensed, age, uh, no. practice area, languages spoken, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, members and firm type. So I was just curious if that was something unique that Director Nevitt does for us and what we've started collecting as information or if that's standard. No, we have about half of that and the other half we don't. Executive Director Nevitt. Well, Governor Grabicki kind of stole some of my thunder, but I did want to share, um, you know, as someone who I grew up in a very rural part of our state, uh, in a town of about 3000 people. Um, and I, when we were on the most recent stops on the listening tour in Pacific County and Mason County, I did think it was, I left both of those stops feeling like a big part of the answer has got to be about encouraging people from those communities to become, uh, legal professionals and return. Um, and that's where, I do think that having a program like the law clerk program where you can become a licensed attorney without going to law school has a lot of promise. I think particularly in our conversation in my home county of Pacific County, uh, the attorneys that we spoke with got really excited about the possibility that they could you know, train people in their community to become lawyers who then wouldn't be burdened with that student loan debt and wouldn't have to be convinced that this is a good place to live. 
Yeah, growing up in the community certain, certainly helped um, with the folks that we talked to um, and return and maybe moving away for a little while, but then coming back. And I imagine that's probably true for a lot of your communities too. Yeah, yeah, and President. How many people here are practicing or living in the community where they grew up? And that's, I mean, it, it's good and I think we should encourage it, but I get a lot of students who are like, I can't wait to move on over out of this, out of the state. So it's, it, it's from the law school side, it's like, how do you address all of these different issues, the people who want to get out of where they grew up or, um, or want to move on to someplace else. Governor Krabicki. You, you have to connect them with, with lawyers um, really early on. And you have to uh, connect them with the process really early on. I mean, I, I think you've got to go for them in high school um, and, and start from there, continue in college and into the law school. And I think if we did that on an organized, consistent basis, we probably could solve the problem. Um, but I think that's what it takes because you're going to have to get kids who have been in a small town, St. Mary's or Riggins, and who may not want to go back to Riggins, but they may be willing to go to, um, you know, Squirrel. Um, and that's, that's what you got to work on, I think. Is Squirrel a real place? Darn right it is. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of my partners has a has a major operation down there. In fact, I think he has a, a branch office in Squirrel. In Squirrel. Well, wow. learn something new every day. <laughs> Executive Director Nevitt. Well, yeah, I did want to add that, you know, it, it's true. I It may be that many of us are not practicing in our hometowns because we're the kind of people who volunteer to serve on the Board of Governors for the Washington State Bar Association. But I will say that when we were in Pacific County, you know, I think many of those folks who are practicing there were from that community. And I think so, but I totally, I think your point is very well taken that, you know, a lot of folks do want to get away from uh, the hometown, but I think there are those who want to stay too. And so hopefully we can design solutions for all of those folks. President-elect Tollison says he's, he's practicing less than a mile from where he grew up. <laughs> Uh, well, we have about 15 minutes le left. And is dinner served at 5.30, Shelly? At 6. Oh, well, we have plenty of time. 5.30. <laughs> the bar's open. Well, wh why don't we just take uh, just a few more minutes, kind of wrap up, and then we'll, and Shelly will tell us where we need to go, and then we can resume our conversations there. Yeah. Um, again, one of the things that's... The, very interesting to me again with this building is thinking about what Washington might do um, with the building in light of COVID. And we haven't talked a lot about what COVID has done, but it's you know changed us from this to that. Uh, and I think this is going to be with us for quite some time, probably a better thing when we can figure out the logistics of it sometimes. Um, but my thinking was coming from a law firm that uh, has offices and big buildings and very expensive space that now law firms may be thinking we don't need that space anymore. People are working from home. And so we take that off, we give them home offices, equip them, um, but others maybe not having this, the conference room space, not having the, the uh, ability to do mediations or depositions that a building, if we purchased one, could offer those services to our members as something as the new normal going forward. President-elect holds it. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a, I, I think that there is so much need for interpersonal collaboration in what we do that I really doubt that the mass of lawyers are going to move away from some sort of communal working arrangement. Uh, I mean, how much time do I spend walking down the hall, interacting with my partners about issues and how much better a lawyer am I for? It? And I think that's true. I think everybody's learning that there are incredible benefits for 
for the technology and there's things that it's going to be great for. I think as we integrate and find the balance between those two things, I think that the, the initial push to say, the downtowns are going to empty out, whether it's not just us as professionals, but from all the other businesses, I think we're going to see that not happen as much as we thought maybe eight or 10 months ago. Um, and I think we're going to see as, as we go through this next increased phase, there's going to be more um, good hell. I want to be with people. I want to be around people. I think we've all missed it. I, I think that that has been a reality. It uh, doesn't mean that the technology isn't important. It doesn't mean that you all, I mean, our, our facility delivers some services. I think it has, I think it's underutilized in some ways and overworked in other ways, right? And finding that balance, I think would be, that'd be a big battle for an organization as big as yours. What, what do we need and how do we, what do we deliver with it? And I think the model that you're talking about is one that several state bars have tried. Um, Nevada being one, and I know um, Utah initially many years ago did the same. So I think it would be best to, um, the concept that you're talking about has been implemented and how that worked for them. I don't know for sure. I mean, we have conference rooms and webcasts. We have all that in our building, but we didn't set it up. Like I told people, it doesn't matter to me if they work at the office or not. We pay the same amount for the building every day. Nobody else is in our building, but us. So you can come or you cannot come. We're still going to pay the same amount other than a little less lights. But um, I think you want to talk to those conceptually. I think that's a good idea. I'm not sure it's played out as well as you might think in some of the bars that I've tried it. And so I would have Tara, do that homework and find out. <laughs> Sorry, Tara. More work for Tara. <laughs> That's our motto. Yeah. <laughs> it's not every state bar's motto. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about Governor Grabicki? You know, what we found in, in Spokane, I, I, my firm is 24 lawyers. And what we found in the, in the larger firms in downtown Spokane, which are basically anywhere from 12 to 35 lawyers, is that the business, estate planning, tax lawyers, transactional lawyers can work pretty easily from home. Um, and most of them did during this uh, COVID business. The litigators couldn't do it at all. The litigators needed to be in the office. They needed to be able to talk to each other constantly. They needed their support staff right there with them. Um, and uh, But even, even, even the business and transactional lawyers found that they wanted to either go in some of the time or at least have Zoom chats with their colleagues. Um, no one's satisfied being isolated. Governor Stevens. Yeah, well, I, on this topic, I just uh, actually believe that um, we're gonna find that hybrids are gonna be really where we go next um, uh, for a number of reasons. But if we just think about uh, I know how many people dislike Zoom or whatever, but that's because it was a even, you know, either or choice. But to begin to think about other ways in which we, um, one, one, when we didn't have the pandemic, we didn't really look into Zoom the way we did, and we had very clunky kind of gatherings. So people who couldn't attend would be on the phone somewhere and disembodied. But I think actually we're probably going to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just more and more convinced that we're going to have a hybrid because while we are social uh, animals, we are also people who realize if they are parents and early parents that it's a way for them to balance home and work uh, and just to make that room um, uh, make that room possible, because this is also then a, a wonderful way in which people who otherwise wouldn't be able to travel to actually travel and access services and participate and, and be present. And so, uh, you know, I thank you all. And, uh, you know, I, I keep saying that uh, the next thing we will have, and I don't know if it'll, hopefully it won't be a pandemic that will cause it, but I'm actually looking forward to the hologram meetings where uh, not only are, you know, we're in these boxes, but there will be empty spaces where actually my hologram will be next to you, even if I am, quote, physically not there. And I think that's going to come. The Star Wars era. <laughs> I'm 
I'm not allowed to make motions as a past president, but I move. We meet in Idaho every year. <laughs> and I'd like to note that, have you guys noticed how good looking people raised in Idaho are? It's just awesome. <laughs> just awesome. <laughs> you know, uh, this meeting uh, went very well. Um, but like I said earlier, they give me a bad time about talking about Oregon. Maybe I'll switch to Idaho. I'll start talking about the great things about Idaho. That would be nice. Well, let's uh, let's wrap things up then, and uh, then retire to Shelley. Where are we going? In the Aspen room. Is that the glass? Oh, from last night. Okay, around the corner. The Aspen room. So that'll we've been going for about two hours. So we'll have a little break, and then start congregating down there, and we'll have dinner and enjoy each other's company. Great. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. Have, Have a great, great dinner.